Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche organization, and I'm very happy to have a special edition today of the daily video update, which will be a conversation with Alex Kiner. Alex is an investor, a financial consultant, an author, and I'm gonna discuss with him his insights on the present situation in Ukraine based on what he wrote in his book, The Grand Deception, The Truth About Bill Browder, The Magnitsky Act, and Anti-Russian Sanctions. Alex, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Harley, and I'm very pleased to be with you this morning. Now, in preparing for this discussion, I reread your book, and I was struck with the parallels between what you were describing about the 1990s shock therapy policy and what is going on today. You describe the commitment of Western elites to destroy Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. Here's what you wrote. They had, those in charge had a Cold War mindset. The objective was, quote, to defeat, dismember, and loot Russia, leave it so weakened and impoverished that it could never again challenge American hegemony. Do you see the war in Ukraine today, the NATO, US, UK war against Russia as coming from that same outlook? Well, I think that is unquestionably the truth of the matter, you know, and I would I would go a, a step further and call it not commitment, but an obsession. And uh, what what is clear and what has been clear for a very long time is that uh, the Western Empire has this one overriding obsession, which is to dominate the Eurasian landmass for its uh, resource, energy riches, for its, uh, you know, has something like uh, two thirds to 70% of the global GDP, 70% of the uh, world's um, population. And this is all money, good collateral for the Western banking uh, cartel. Uh, the problem is that you cannot dominate this vast expanse of space and wealth militarily. So what has been the strategy of the empire since the days of the of the British Empire is to keep the the uh, the space uh, broken up in smaller, um, weaker political entities that you can always pit one against the other, keep them weak, impoverished dependent on you for uh, financial and military aid uh, while your banks and corporations loot uh, all of these countries for whatever um, you know the the western industries desire and this is clearly the objective with the military conflict in ukraine which is practically an ideal means to weaken Russia and ultimately to lead to a regime change and to bring uh, some kind of a new Juan Guaido uh, who would, like Boris Yeltsin in the 1990s, allow the Western interests to uh, manage Russia however they see fit. What I'd like to get into now is the, the effects of the looting under the shock therapy policy. You have a very thorough review of that. Just Give us a summary. What what did they do to grab these resources after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991? The Western financial interests have already prepared the terrain uh, through the 1980s, while uh, uh, Russia was still part of the Soviet Union. They already had their uh, financial, economic, banking uh, consultants uh, go in there. Uh, they were able to get uh, from the Gorbachev government uh, permits to set up private uh, banks as their, as their tools uh, within Russia. And uh, when the Soviet Union fell, there was a slew of Western advisors and uh, consultants who went into Russia and practically managed Boris Yeltsin government through a network of uh, private agencies and non-government organizations. Uh, what they did is basically uh, create a quote unquote legal means uh, to conduct 
what what can be only be described as a as a as a massive pirate raid on Russia. So uh, you had a name name a man named Walter Cole who was uh, managing the USAID at the time in Russia who said basically outright, if we needed a decree, uh, Boris Yeltsin's government didn't have to go through the bureaucracy, and so they got whatever decree they needed to conduct this uh, massive transfer of Russia's wealth in wealth into Western hands. We're talking about hundreds of uh, billions of dollars that were looted out of Russia. Uh, the process was so destructive. This is one of the things that, you know, uh, President Vladimir Putin has said that this has been one of the greatest tragedies, if not the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. And it's not... You know, in the West, it's widely misinterpreted as him having nostalgia for the Soviet Union. That's not the case. This really was a massive tragedy in in terms of in humanitarian terms. Uh, the result of uh, the 1990s transition that was managed by Western advisors through Boris Yeltsin's government was that uh, something like 60 million Russians uh, fell into poverty. Um, quarter of Russian population was living in what the, what the World Bank des described as uh, desperate poverty. Uh, we had, during the first six years of the transition, we had something like 170,000 uh, Russians dying by murder. Uh, crime and criminality was rampant. Uh, you had uh, large out outbreaks of uh, easily treatable diseases like, uh, like diphtheria, like uh, cancer, the the health system basically crumbled, uh, people suffered hunger, and grand total of everything, uh, Russia lost between uh, five and six million uh, people. So uh, compared to the compared to the normal um, population trends, Russian population was, re was reduced by five to six million people for this this is between 3.4 and 4% of the total population of Russia. Uh, the mortality rates increased to 60%, which is only experienced by nations that are at war. And so this, this has been the tragedy of Russia in the 1990s, entirely, entirely engineered by Western financial interests through uh, various agencies like uh, USAID, World Bank, IMF, uh, and so on. Uh, there have been Western advisors uh, like uh, David Lipton, um, Anders Aslund, who is still very busy uh, tweeting vitriol against Russia to this day, and uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who I have to I have to take exception about Jeffrey Sachs because my research found him to be a relatively earnest person in this whole mess. And he did try to do the right thing and eventually resigned. Well, Alex, let me pick up on what you were just saying, that you, you wrote about the role of institutions such as the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the New York Fed. And these are the same institutions responsible for the prevention of development in the so-called developing sector through the same kind of policies, privatization, austerity, debt payment comes first. And you describe the effect of the shock therapy in Russia as an inflationary spiral that, that depressed the standard of living, but at the same time, deindustrialization. Are you surprised that the people who are running the rules-based order today continue to rely on these same institutions, uh, which have failed repeatedly? Well, I, I think they haven't failed. We just don't, you know, there's just a, a very sharp difference between what they are uh, uh, intended for and what they're being sold as. You know, the the facade of the of the of the agenda always has them as uh, helping uh, nations develop, uh, helping root out corruption, whereas in reality they do the exact opposite, and they seek to. You know, they seek to weaken and impoverish these nations so that they can be turned into uh, a pool of cheap labor 
and uh, industry that merely extracts uh, those nations' natural resources for the benefit of Western interests. I don't know if we have a single example where IMF and World Bank actually uh, brought a developing nation from out of poverty and into prosperity. These are the changes that are happening today, maybe, but more through influence of uh, Russia and China than through uh, Western influence. Western business has always been colonization. Uh, it's never been about dealing with this nation on a fair basis. It's always been about bludgeoning them into submission and plundering their wealth. Now, one of those plunderers who's the subject of your book is Bill Browder, uh, who was someone who came up under some very unsavory characters such as Robert Maxwell, Edmund Safra, uh, worked with the uh, American networks that were involved in looting using privatization. Uh, just tell us a little bit about what you learned about Browder and then also importantly, his role in pushing sanctions, which have become the policy, the, the go-to policy of the West today, but the sanctions against Russia with the Magnitsky Act were sort of a, a prelude for what's going on today. So give us a little picture of uh, Browder. Uh, so Bill Browder used to be um, the manager of the Hermitage Fund, fund in Moscow, which during the 1990s was the largest foreign-owned hedge fund in Russia. And so he was one of the main participants in this whole business of plundering Russia. And his investors were people like Edmund Safra, who is the late, who used to be the, the owner and manager of the uh, Republic National Bank of New York. Um, Bill Browder invested in uh, Russian uh, companies like Gazprom, like Electricity Utility and, and others. And uh, he was in 2000, in November of 2005, he was finally thrown out by, by Vladimir Putin's government. His visa was canceled. He was uh, sent on a return flight to London and he was never allowed to go back again. And that pretty much uh, broke his business. His, his, his fund was eventually closed. It couldn't function. Uh, with him being uh, outside of Russia. And so I think that he is very pained by, uh, by the fact that he was unable to continue looting Russia and making hundreds of millions of dollars for himself and his clients. And so he went from one of the loudest uh, cheerleaders for Vladimir Putin and his government to one of the loudest um, uh, demonizers of Russia and Vladimir Putin. Uh, in 2015, I think, he published a book named uh, Red Notice, which I'm absolutely convinced were, convinced that it was a uh, ghost written by Lee Child, uh, and it was pretty much put together like a, a spy thriller, and it turned out to be a bestseller. Uh, I read the book, uh, and I was struck by how the whole narrative is based on lies and falsehoods. Nevertheless, that very narrative enabled Bill Browder in 2012 to lobby through U.S. Congress uh, the so-called Magnitsky Act, which is a piece of legislation that ostensibly on human rights basis allows the U.S. government to sanction uh, individuals and businesses in Russia if they found them to be infringing on human rights. Uh, the, the legislation itself, apart from being based on, on a fraudulent narrative that, that, that should have taken five minutes of proper due diligence in the US Congress to shoot it down and, to, and, and not to pass it, uh, is also, it's, it's also a, an abomination with regards to Western legal standards in the sense that it doesn't at all provide for any due diligence, um, sorry, due, due process. So basically what happens is that some unnamed bureaucrat from the United States Treasury can put any Russian person on uh, the so-called Magnitsky list and automatically their assets uh, in the US uh, get frozen. 
and they can be prevented from obtaining U.S. visas, from traveling, and so forth. Which is, you know, it's, it, it may sound ha harmless, but it's actually it can be very debilitating to anybody who, you know, for whatever legitimate reasons, might want to travel uh, around the world to conduct business around the world, um, whatever it may be. And they have no way to challenge the fact that they've been put on the Magnitsky list and there is no uh, legal recourse. And the fact that there's no due, uh, uh, how do you call it? The fact, the fact that the, that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, include this uh, due diligence process on the part of, uh, of uh, US legal authorities tells you that it's just somebody on it happens on somebody's whim and it should never have become part of US legal system nevertheless it has been the opening salvo of the new cold war against Russia and um, you know the reason why I even published my book was because I realized that if this process continues, it's going to lead us straight to a to a new world war. And the the objective was my book of my book was try to unmask these networks because Bill Browder is just one man, man with a very powerful political backing, mainly from within the British deep state establishment and financial cartel. And that was leading us straight into the Third World War, and my endeavor was to unmask it and to try to you know add a voice to preventing this from happening again well he's resurfaced this last couple of weeks uh with more virulent anti-putin statements saying that no matter how many people have to die putin has to be overthrown uh, you you write about the standard line against putin he played a, a at least a, a partial role in in facilitating the promotion of this idea of Putin as a criminal, as a, as that Putin is the one stealing money. Uh, why do you think they put him out there again this week? I think that they put him out there, uh, uh, out there this week again, because they are getting very desperate. Um, the West is getting defeated in Ukraine. And if the West gets defeated in Ukraine, I think it's pretty much game over for the empire. Uh, the fact that they uh, rolled out Bill Browder to try to pour more vitriol against Russia and Vladimir Putin, uh, to me, reeks of sheer desperation because Browder's credibility has been pretty much shot down. His lies are comical. They're very easy to debunk. And he's insisting on telling and retelling the same lies that have already been uh, unmasked and and shown to be false. He's uh, well, okay. Here's a very simple way that he's lying. He's saying that Russia, that Vladimir Putin is the richest man in the world. That the way he became rich is by shaking down the Russian oligarchs, and he keeps uh, telling this story about how he put uh, uh, Khodorkovsky in prison and uh, how all the other uh, oligarchs went to Vladimir Putin to make sure that they don't end up in prison. And that Vladimir Putin uh, uh, basically tells them, okay, if you don't want to end up in prison, uh, you turn over 50% of your wealth to me. Well, in Red Notice, uh, Bill Browder explains this. And he also explains that he doesn't have any idea that this is true at all, that he doesn't, he, he, he hasn't been privy to these meetings, supposed meetings between Vladimir Putin and the oligarchs, and that he doesn't know if it's 50% or 70% or 10% or maybe 0%. He has just pulled a narrative from his back end, and he's insisting on telling it to everybody. Uh, but I'm not sure how many people buy Bill Browder's story anymore. And so the fact that of all the people that they might have uh, rolled out to uh, continue demonizing Vladimir Putin, the fact that they've chose Bill Browder again tells me that they have nothing, that they, they are out of ammunition, that they, have, they are out of ideas, and that they are just hoping that some of these lies are somehow going to stick and that they might galvanize Western public into finally 
you know, um, deciding that, okay, yeah, you know, we've had enough of this business with Vladimir Putin, let's all go to war and let's have World War III and then everything is going to be utopia. I, I would urge all of our viewers to get a copy of your book, The Grand Deception, because it's filled with insights, facts, and I, I think you can help tell from what Alex is discussing, totally relevant for looking at the world at the direction we're headed. With that, I, I have one final question for you. <clears throat> we, we're facing warnings here in Europe of a terrible winter, uh, inflation, food and fuel shortages, uh, having to choose between medical bills or having heat in your home. And of course, the leaders of NATO countries are saying this is all Putin's fault. Do you have a sense that the protests which have already begun will grow and that will force the governments of EU countries, European Union countries, to break with the US, UK, NATO narrative, and which is to continue the war? Do you think they'll be forced to pull out of the war and do you see the possibility of a breakup of the European Union over this? I think that there's an inevitability that the European Union will break up and that NATO will, will also break up. I think it's only a question of time. And I think at, at this time, maybe only a miracle could uh, save them and give them another lease of life. And when I say a miracle, maybe that would have to be some kind of a successful convincing false flag attack in Ukraine or somewhere in in one of the NATO nations but i you know i think that that would be extremely difficult for them to pull out i think that much of the world is wisening up to the the tactics and the strategies of the british empire they're seeing through it and i think that the most recent events have only added to this i see that people are really um increasingly paying attention to what is really going on. I think that the credibility of Western leadership and of Western media is falling through the floor. And I think that the old narratives are just simply not washing anymore. We see now that very recently, Turkey has clearly pivoted. Uh, you know, uh, President uh, Erdogan has been trying to sit on both chairs uh, for a long time. But I think that even finally, he has seen that uh, there's no point uh, relying on the West. Uh, I see that the pressures are building on Germany to chart its own course. You know, recently, well, yesterday, actually, uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz returned from China. Uh, he has come back with statements that play to the to the. You know, he's he's talking about uh, how he pressured uh, Chinese leadership to break with Russia, to withdraw, uh, to to help persuade Russia to withdraw from Ukraine, and so on and so forth. But I think that the reality of the matter is that uh, some part of German leadership understands that they have no future with their so-called friends and allies, because these friends and allies are actually actively working on destroying Germany, deindustrializing and plunging German population into poverty. And they realize that if they go along with this agenda, that it's it, the, the future is very, very bleak. Uh, 100 German corporations have petitioned to join Chancellor Scholz on his trip to Russia. Only 12 were admitted, but these people have very, very strong influence on German policy. Um, German trade with China, even in these recent months, have been, have, have been growing very, very strongly. And I think that rather than Germany influencing China to break with Russia, that the effect will be more the opposite, that the Chinese and, and, and the Russians will um, influence Germany to break with NATO, to break with uh, the European Union and chart its own course. Uh, this week on Wednesday, uh, President Erdogan on Turkey, who has been very important middleman between, uh, you know, Russia and Ukraine, between Russia and Western powers, he went on on Turkish TV and gave a statement. And one of the things I thought was extremely interesting is he suggested that. 
German Chancellor Scholz has actually changed his mind in the last month and that he will be trying to find common language with Vladimir Putin. Of course, he will have a very strong opposition to this in, within Germany, and we can already see that uh, the Greens are grumbling, that they are accusing Chancellor Scholz of uh, conducting uh, Germany's foreign policy in an autocratic way. Um, uh, Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock has been criticizing uh, Chancellor Scholz. So it remains to be seen, but the pressures are clearly there, and those pressures are only going to be increasing, particularly because, you know, the, the, the current preparation for the winter offensive in Ukraine have been devastatingly effective. 40% of uh, uh, Ukraine's energy infrastructure has been pretty much destroyed. The, the Ukrainian population is looking to a winter of freezing and starvation. And so this will inevitably cause a massive new wave of migrations from Ukraine towards Poland, towards Germany and other Western European countries, which will only exacerbate further the political pressures and, and, and cracks uh, in, in, in the European Union and NATO. So I think that the, the coming winter will be extremely interesting. I think that the danger is that uh, the British and the NATO and the Poles and the Ukrainians uh, managed to conduct some kind of a convincing false flag attack. But I think that the, that the, the grassroots effects, the, the pressures from the industry and the labor unions who are increasingly making a common front against this collective suicide, I think will strongly pull in the opposite direction, in the direction of Eurasian integrations, where the future really looks bright. I, I participated last week in the in the Eurasian Economics Forum in Baku in, in uh, Azerbaijan. And my very strong impression is that, you know, there's an underlying sense of optimism about the future. And I think that the populations of the Western countries today want to be part of that they don't want to freeze they don't want to starve they want don't want to uh, go to war on some um incoherent uh false ideology uh and they don't want to eat insects and they, they don't want to fight climate change they want to live in peace and prosperity and so this is a big grassroots uh tsunami that's hitting an agenda that's basically being run by a very, very small, narrow circle of elites based in London, on Wall Street, in Davos, and so forth. And I think that inevitably they will be defeated. It's only, it's only a matter of time now. Well, Alex, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. And again, I would urge our viewers to get your book, The Grand Deception, which I understand Bill Browder tried to stop from being published, but uh, you persevered and, and that's a good sign. So thanks for joining us today and see you again tomorrow. Great pleasure, Harley. Uh, greetings to your viewers and listeners and uh, have a good day.